something's got to give. And, and so either you've got to have such a low dose of testosterone or you may get more side effects of estrogen or you might have a lack of estrogen clearance. I mean, people, this is so controversial, this topic. There are two camps. There's the anti-estrogen people and there's the pro-estrogen people. There's got to be a happy place in the middle. I don't see a happy place. Well, I'll wait until, well, we're still rolling, right? So I can go ahead. All right, so we're back with Dr. Rand McLean, TRT expert in California. He's been pivotal and spreading the, the word about the benefits of testosterone replacement therapy. And as part of testosterone replacement therapy, many men do perfectly fine doing their testosterone treatment. Other men may require, for fertility reasons, gonadotropins like HCG or HMG. There have been talk about the ability for the body to self-regulate its levels. As we know, testosterone is a three if you will, molecules in one, or three drugs in one, testosterone, estradiol, and dihydrotestosterone as being the metabolites of testosterone. So we're gonna speak with Dr. McLean, Dr. Rand, uh, what his thoughts are, how he manages his patients, and if he even looks at estradiol or, or manages it. So hi, hi, Dr. McLean, how are you? <laughs> oh, I'm smiling because yes, I have uh, plenty to say. Uh, I don't I don't apologize for being opinionated on this one because I've just seen too much in clinical practice. I don't know how the controversy we were talking about earlier got started here because there, there is no controversy as far as I see. I mean, anyone who looks at the research or is in clinical practice sees no controversy. I've seen some people that are not qualified to speak to it, speak to it and stir up the pot. I don't want to get into it, so I won't name names. Uh, one individual, though, is associated, uh, I think he's an associate professor at Stanford, which is a prestigious university here, and claims that, you know, the side effects that people attribute to estrogen, such as gynecomastia, is really due to prolactin. I have won 100% of my wagers with patients who come in swearing it's, it's prolactin. I said I'd pay for the testing if I'm wrong, and 100% of the time, the prolactin was just fine and the estrogen was too high. We know that, well, first let me say this for the record. You cannot obliterate estrogen. You can't bury it to avoid some of the potential side effects because there actually are side effects to doing just that. And we need some estrogens for brain health, uh, heart health, and joint health. And there are, although they're rare instances, they still are significant enough uh, to mention there, there are people when you do accidentally or not bury the estrogen, they have symptoms. For example, uh, achy joints, not where you fell off your motorbike when you were younger uh, on your shoulder, but all over, sort of like flu-like aches. Uh, you can have erectile dysfunction, um, which I think is largely secondary to the other, which is a loss of sensation in the genitalia. So, you know, it is an issue to over-suppress it, certainly. But to under-suppress it, I would argue, is much more of a concern because excess estrogen can appear as uh, water retention, fat retention, moodiness and irascibility you know what a lot of people attribute to so-called roid rage that guy in the gym who puts on uh, 30 pounds in three months half of it looks like he's in his face because he's holding so much water uh, and he goes from being a regular guy to a jerk right that that's from excess estrogen not necessarily an attribute of an anabolic steroid although there are some like halotestin and, and some others that do have a profile that lends itself to being kind of ornery and aggressive but most of them particularly uh, uh, testosterone, leads to more of a happiness, not an, an aggravated predisposition. Yeah, actually, I think I saw a study on mice where they, they would give a big injection to mice, and they found that rather than mice being more aggressive, that they were wanted to cuddle more with the, with the female partner. But then on the second injection of the, I don't know how good the study was, then, then the mouse got a bit more aggressive. But in, up until before the second injection, when another male mouse would enter the, the cage, it wasn't being aggressive towards it, almost as if it were in conversation with it. So I, I don't know. I, I've always thought testosterone is a more calming and, and and their, their takeaway was, well, that second injection then may have been too much, but maybe maybe it, it over uh, aromatized into, into estradiol uh, because you had so much more testosterone. Yeah, but when it gets outside of homeostatic range, the higher you go, the more is converted. And that's the first thought that came to my mind. I mean, I don't know what the proof is, and I'm not big on uh, studies that use Worcester rats, which are overweight and diabetic rats to begin with. But 
not well, <laughs> not necessarily the uh, optimized, well, maybe the norm these days to represent patients, unfortunately. But anyway, um, the, the problem is that even if some patients don't get breast tissue enlargement, which is another major side effect of estrogens being high, and it's a natural effect of the spikes in testosterone that occur when we're teenagers and males, where because so much testosterone is spiked and, and therefore and thereby estrogen also spikes, they get um, the, the vernacular they use here is corkscrews, corkscrew nipples, something like that, but gynecomastia, breast tissue there. Um, and, and the same thing happens in males that use TRT and don't protect against excess estrogen. It doesn't happen to all males though, which, which people use to say, oh, see, he is not using an AI and, and his, more importantly than that, his estrogen's really high and he doesn't have breast tissue and he's not holding water. Okay, well, people react differently. But here's the one that should convince anyone. If you're not gonna stick to what I consider the obvious already, if you want to point to the guy that has an estradiol sensitive of 165 picograms per milliliter, and you'll have to do the conversion for me for what you guys do in your country, but that's extremely high. Um, and yet he's, he's diced because he's got no, I mean, he's got a perfect diet. He exercises every day, he sleeps well, et cetera. And in his genes, he just doesn't have the, the breast tissue there to grow. Then I would caution those examples, or I would caution them to look even deeper at estrones because we know that all males are destined for prostate cancer if we long, live long enough, right? We all have the gene or genes for prostate cancer. What we know now is that just like females can have a predisposition, there are at least two estron, estrones that have been identified. Estrones are estrogens. By the way, we're using estradiol as a surrogate for all the estrogens. So when we use an AI, we're trying to reduce all the estrogens. And this leads to a whole other problem is that while it's a pretty good surrogate marker, I run across patients, maybe you have too, that look like they're controlled because their estradiol is, but then for some reason, they're still having these unusual side effects. Even though we're managing their estradiol, they still get nipple sensitivity. Well, we do an extra assay and find out for whatever reason, their estrones are really high. Well, in the estrone family, we've got uh, 216 alpha hydroxyestrone and, and 14 hydroxyestrone, which we know will promote uh, estrogen sensitive cancers. For men, we're talking about prostate cancer, guys. So if you're not having symptoms and think you're home scot free, you're not necessarily at all. Um, and then I would say. Oh, what would be the solution then? From the start, you want to limit the amount of estrogens to what is optimum. And, and, and here I shoot for normally 15 to 20 picograms per milliliter, although for people that are sensitive to oversuppression, and it's almost to the, to the, one point sometimes you'll see some individuals, uh, you know, we might have to float it up a little higher. So it's between 25 and 35 picograms per milliliter. It doesn't matter. Still within normal limits. Well, what was your question before I go rambling again? How do you get the estrone then in, in the right, right place? You're, you're generally uh, reducing it to a safer level, an ideal level. So you have enough, right, but not too much for side effects. If someone is producing, and I argue, too much of any of those two I mentioned, estrones is a bad thing. You can modulate that by giving them, well, you can recommend they eat a lot of cruciferous vegetables like broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, uh, mustard greens, or you can take in a supplement form the active ingredient, methane, which will convert the bad estrogens I spoke of, the estrone family, into the estradiol and also prevent conversion to the bad estrones to begin with. So. That's a great protector. Uh, certainly any female who's on estrogen therapy, that's a top recommendation that I recommend. So DIM, DIM it's referred to, yeah? D DIM. But yes. What about calcium deglucurate? Uh, that's supposed to also help uh, work like cruciferous yep. vegetables. Yep. Well, I'm not sure. I'll have to go back and check to see if it works directly on those estrones or just estrogens in general. But yes, we, we use that in a supplement formula because it doesn't require a prescription to help reduce estrogens also. But I can tell you, again, there's no controversy. If you want to avoid growing breast tissue, gynecomastia, if you want to avoid holding excess water and fat because of you know, excess estrogen, as well as protecting yourself against moodiness and irascibility, you must control the estrogen. Now, we were talking about our experience. I didn't share mine, but just like you, 
you know, when I first started, I was taking, I was in my thirties and I was taking a milligram every other day. I mean, sorry, every day and not to talk about me, but just to get, you know, give an example, like my patients. And as you described yours, the longer you are on TRT, it seems that and we're talking about male patients, now, obviously the less you need to protect yourself. For some reason, your body starts converting less and less uh, testosterone into estrogen such that now I'm on one milligram per week to keep it at the same level I was fighting so hard to, you know, to do so before. Uh, why that happens, I don't know, but it's certainly convenient, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've, I've in the past only needed like a quarter every 10 days of that. And I think for the longest time now, I've not used, used any, especially after I had the gynecomastia surgery. Now, one thing I would ask you, if I may, um, in your experience, because we talked about the differences between creams and, and esterified forms of testosterone you know, to be injected, do you find that because of those supra-physiologic spikes in daily dosing, there's more estrogen that needs to be controlled, just like with DHT we were talking about earlier? And so it really is, if, if you've got somebody on a, uh, on a daily dose of a cream, it's, I'm not going to say convenient, but it's, it's easy to match that up with an astrozole on a more regular basis, right, in a, maybe a smaller dose, uh, but definitely a higher strength, say, on a weekly basis because of those daily spikes. Have, have you found that to be true? Well, some of the patients that are on testo cream, many don't, don't use an, an AI. Besides that, what I can say is as the testosterone rises, we also see estradiol rising on the blood tests. So if we test them 12 hours later and the level's at 30 nanomolars per liter, like 800 nanograms per deciliter, you're going to see an estradiol anywhere from, you know, 30 to 100, depending on, on the patient, depending on how much body fat they've got, right? It, depending on how uh, much of a rheumatizer they are. So I've also seen that with people who say, well, just do microdosing of injections or do, do subcutaneous injections. I've also seen blood levels on these guys. They, they're still getting higher testosterone levels on trough and higher estrogen levels or estradiol levels are being measured. Now, some say they feel better because they're not getting a massive amount all the time, but or at least one massive amount of watching it fall, but everyone's so different. I, you know, I, re I really don't know. It's, <laughs> it's a tough one because everyone loves all these new fangled, hey, let's, let's do microdosing because it sounds wonderful. And, and some people, they swear that's the only thing that they've allowed them to say, look, I, I, it tends to be the engineer types as well. They, they say, I just want to put it in my diary. I just like, I won't forget it because it's every day, um, same time every day, I'll just do my injection and that's going to be that. You know, and I'll know I got it every single day. There's almost an anxiety around it, right? Where other guys are, they just want to do it once a week or other guys just want to do their creams. But all in all, you know, some guys, no complaint, estradiol's acceptable. And other guys, it's just like, they like, no, please, I, I got to do something about this estradiol. And, and that's, you know, I think that's very individual, but it's a little bit anxiety induced is the, the, the PSA or not the PSA, the, the, the risk of prostate cancer from the estrones um, is something that I think lots of people would be a bit concerned about. Do you have any, like you can send me the, the links to the literature or things that you found that's, that kind of matches up with, with the higher East. I think I have read that estrones, as you said, are, are linked to the breast cancer and the prostate cancer. Yeah, we've been following that for probably, you know, way back 20 years ago, but it's become more and more of the, the popular theory. It's not so much a, uh, a theory as a, as a realization, just like with women, that that definitely promotes it. I'm not sure we think it's the, I mean, it's probably, they're probably not the only two estrones that create a problem, but we know those two definitely do create a problem. Um, and so why wouldn't we control? I mean, the worst thing to me seems to be, we find something that we can control that optimizes health, that restores our our youth, vigor, you know, and then we end up having to rob Peter to pay Paul down the road for something we didn't consider until it's too late. That prostate cancer sneaks up on you. It's not something that you're going to go, oh, wow, well, I can tell that's coming my way, unless you read that. But I mean, I'm talking about feeling-wise and symptom-wise. And then, unfortunately, you get the diagnosis one day, and then what? You know, we know what the mechanisms are, so why not, if you're not experiencing any side effects, still protect yourself from something that can happen down the road? It just, why, why ruin the party if you don't have to? And for what? Uh, you know, something that costs 20 cents a day here in the States, that's if you're taking the supplement and if, you know, if you don't enjoy broccoli. Of course, of course. So for the supplements, but then the other uh, medications to manage the estradiol. So you're saying the supplements 
are the most, I guess, natural way to help kind of control control that. Is there another level of, of, of treatment that you consider, like aromatase inhibitors, then for for men who are trying to control estrogen or estrone, essentially? Or, or do we are we not sure if they will work on that same mechanism? Well, the AIs are, well, the AIs are going to reduce overall estrogens, right? Um, what we're doing with the DIM is to try and within that group skew the estrogens that are remaining to the ones that we know are uh, certainly less harmful and arguably helpful in certain, like estriol, we know, can't say anything bad about estriol. Sometimes we can say something about estriol, but I, I think if you dig into the research, it's because of what it can get converted to rather than it, you know, what it does, the properties of it itself. But estrones, again, we, we've identified two. Now, they're not all bad, but, you know, again, because those two are so bad, we definitely want to bring those down to a lower level. Dr. Rousier, are you familiar with Dr. Rousier? Um, I, I think back in the AMMG yes, meeting, yes. he had a presentation uh, next to Dr. Chrysler. And, you know, Dr. Chrysler's argument was the dose makes the poison. You know, he said he's seen men who take a little bit of aromatase inhibitor and they wee out all this leftover water and they feel better. This is what he saw clinically. Dr. Rousier's argument was why, why give estradiol? You know, estradiol is used in prostate cancer for treatment or some forms of, you know, estrogens. Uh, he argues that, um, you know, you shouldn't be worried about this number, uh, that, the, that where the testosterone converts in the different tissues, it converts to give itself just enough pleiotropic conversion. It gives itself just enough uh, estradiol where it needs to go in those tissues. That was that as the argument for Dr. Rousier. So, and ever since then, I think it was like 2018, there's been this, these two camps out there, you know, some doctors, some non-medical, they're arguing on either side. And I just, I don't know where this has come from, this, this division, because we've always tried to take a very balanced approach. We've had, um, you know, Dr. George Suleatos and, and, and Nelson Virgil, author and very much involved in TRT, you know, talking about estrogen, how high is too high. I'll put the link above for the video that we did. But it's like... It's a tough one because obviously no one wants to have the fear, and really all men have the fear hanging over the head, especially in your forties. Like, oh, what if you know my, my uh, the PSA keeps rising and I've got a prostate cancer? No one wants that. Same as women don't want to have the fear if they got the BRCA genes or the, you know, they're at risk of having breast cancer. Could it be that those who do respond to this estrone or any of the estrogens that there's a genetic component that would lend them to be more so? And could you? maybe get a, a genetic test to, to, to see if you're one of these people that higher estradiol could, can affect, or, or is that just futile? As far as I know, I mean, I, it would be easy to assume that some men are gonna have a greater predisposition than others, because we know that there are some men, <coughs> excuse me, who, for example, get a, a form of prostate cancer that's more aggressive and typically earlier in life. So it's easy to assume that there are gonna be differences. But as far as, does estrogen, uh, you know, contribute these certain estrogens? I don't think there's any dispute. What I would dispute, with all due respect to a doctor, Rosier, is that, you know, you've gone too far initially with your, your first assumption. If you already have prostate cancer, then treating it with estrogen is very different than if you don't have prostate cancer, okay? I'm not a big fan of treating prostate cancer with estrogens, by the way. The two are completely different, okay? And so that's a mistaken assumption to begin with. And anything based upon that, I think we throw out. So with all due respect, I think that's an errant uh, uh, basis for, for, for discussion to begin with. Um, just like growth hormone is not inherently bad, but if you have cancer, you certainly don't want to be taking it. Duh. So I, I, that argument I don't, I don't buy for the, that very reason. The presumption is not good to begin with. We also know that testosterone, albeit a very underpowered study of just uh, 15 people, the last one I read, it's called, uh, it was treating prostate with bipolar testosterone therapy. They treated them, they pulled it, they treated and pulled it, and effectively, successfully treated prostate cancer in, a, again, very underpowered study. The consensus is that testosterone is actually beneficial, and it's the, the metabolites that we have a problem with. Again, I won't beat up a dead horse already about estrogen, but dihydrotestosterone, if you have extant prostate cancer, will make it grow faster. It's like adding fuel to the fire. So that is something you also want to pare down if you do have prostate cancer. There's uh, plenty of guys, including Dr. George, I think you just mentioned, right? Um, 
who, who believe that, you know, as long as you're healthy and aren't experiencing BPH, enjoy DHT. It makes you even healthier until you have to compensate for things that happen, right? That's life. But I don't, yeah, estrogen, we know, again, has some benefits, but in excess is a problem and you definitely have to modulate it. Now, Nelson's a, a, a I consider him a really good friend of mine. And we've talked about this back and forth. He's not for completely letting estrogen go, at least for more recent discussions. He's not necessarily an advocate, in other words, of, of not controlling it. I think he's more along Chrysler's lines, which is, and I completely agree, as usual, the poison's in the dose. And you just have to find the right amount. And it is going to vary from person to person. I was going to find on, on the top. Some people will talk about the ratio of testosterone and estradiol. And as long as the ratio is, is okay, because some of the men who have experienced the, the negative issues of, of prostate cancer, may, it may be because they had low testosterone and high estradiol. But if a man's on TRT and they're not experiencing symptoms and they've got the right ratio of, of testosterone and estradiol without an AI, do they still need uh, uh, to kind of manage that estrogen either with an AI or a natural supplement? That makes sense. The argument I would say based upon those conditions would be, of course not, because as long as you were controlling the the differential within the estrogens, in other words, keeping the estrones down, specifically the the two six uh, the, the what is it the two sixteen alpha hydroxyestrone and the four hydroxyestrone, then you would be covering your bases. If you're not holding water, not growing breast tissue, feeling great, and you have the right ratio, again, it makes sense why because if your testosterone is high enough to protect you, particularly your prostate in this case, then yeah, you, you don't have a problem as long as those estrones are not. Uh, going too high, and you don't have the side effects of excess estrogen makes total sense to me. You know, again, that would fit that individual uh, circumstance that we talk about. And then could perhaps uh, PD five inhibitors like Tadalafil work when your body fat's low enough as a as a mild, I guess you say, aromatase inhibitor in, in, in that line, right? So, I mean, I, I've noticed myself the mm -hmm. use of PD five inhibitors seems to help, you know, at least some symptoms. And this is why I think for men with BPH, they sometimes recommend Tadalafil. Do you think it's because of a an estrogen managing mechanism or? I can't speak to being an estrogen modulator, but certainly is protective to not only your prostate, but I owe uh, the credit all des deserve, is deserving to uh, Dr. Shippen, Eugene Shippen, as he turned me on to this. There was a study in um, Heart Magazine, the Heart Journal, 2017, uh, 44, roughly 44,000 Swedish men having their first heart attack. It was all a plumbing issue, so they put them on a statin for good reason. Also, TRT and PD-5 inhibitors, and there was a direct correlation between the amount of PD-5 inhibitors taken each week and all-cause mortality reduction. So to me, it's an absolute no-brainer to go on like the five, if you can stand it, uh, people have certain side effects of different types, like the daily Cialis, just for good health as well as its erectile function. Yeah, five milligrams. That's so funny. Years ago, um, I knew a lovely, under, um, lovely ophthalmologist who swore that it should be in the water for everyone. And that's, now, and that's a bit controversial because some ophthalmologists don't like the PD-5 inhibitors because of issues with, uh, with um, I think, uh, ocular occlusion or... Well, there's their rare disorders though. I know what you're referring to and I'm not gonna remember the name of at least one of them because one of my patients uh, just recently, a good friend of mine has that and could not use a PD-5 inhibitor, but that's not the norm. And, and look at the, the um, I mean, um, I always think of Dr. Nathan Bryant who, um, really further the work of the Nobel Prize winner, I'm not gonna remember his name, that had to do with um, all his work with nitric oxide. Again, it's a no-brainer. It, up, you know, it upregulates C, uh, uh, C, A, and P, and, and uh, I mean, there's just so many good things to it, you know, with the immune system. Uh, yeah, I could argue that's one you could put in the water or, you know, eat a lot of the precursors. You know, we, we've had a lot of bad press related to nitrites, uh, you know, the, the stuff that's in, uh, but there's sodium nitrites that are in the sausages and stuff like that. Um, and unfortunately, that had a negative effect on the understanding of, of nitrites and the way they're formed either through the nitric oxide synth synthase mechanisms, you know, in, in the vasculature or just actually starting with the bacteria in the mouth from, from consumed uh, like leafy greens and particularly beets, of course. I just just for the record, though, Italian ham, uh, Palmer ham that doesn't contain nitrites or nitrates, just for the record. As long as it tastes good, that's all I care about. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, it tastes nice. It's just salt and, and, and ham, but, uh, and it's nice if you don't want to use bacon, you can just have a uh, prosciutto uh, or Italian parma ham. Every morning for me, my bacon and eggs and toast. So that's a nice, it's just something about the way the eggs interact with the, with the pork it, it, or with the kind of, and the pork and the salt, it makes it nice. As yeah, we can go on all day. So it's interesting. Again, this, this topic, I, you know, it's, it's just one of those things that, uh, I think you need to be aware of. I think with, with testosterone, we talked about how it balances out if you have the right ratio. Um, there have been certainly many people that have talked about this over the years. And I think it's just something we'll just keep having to watch the space and, and see how, how it plays out. But I, I guess, as you're saying, if you've got symptoms along with the right wrong ratio of testosterone and estradiol, there may be things to do to, to minimize um, the, the risk of things getting out of control. And everyone sounds like it's different. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Again, thanks for, uh, for thanks for coming on. It's a great, great topic, and uh, and good to get your insight. Uh, for everyone watching, again, if you've got questions or comments about this topic, please let us know, and um, do subscribe. We'll have more content coming soon. So thanks again. Thanks, Doctor Rand. No, no, thank you, Mike. Much obliged. Really, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. We want to bring awareness to our audience. We want to educate everyone on testosterone and its effects on health and overall therapies used and tailored specifically to each individual so that you can get back your physical performance, your youthful energy. And this is done through TRT, testosterone replacement therapy. Thanks again, Dr. Rand. And for everyone watching, let us know your biggest takeaway that you've learned from this episode. And if you'd like to have Dr. Rand McLean on again, let us know and we'll make it happen. Yes, sir.